In this lesson, we're going to talk about inductive and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is the concept of patterns. You've probably seen this particular pattern when looking at your nines table. There's a little trick that you can do with your hands where you put down one finger and it tells you the answer when you multiply that particular number that you represented with your finger by nine. But the reason this works is because of this nine pattern. So basically, let's just look at some of the products involving nine. 1 times 9 is 9. 2 times 9 is 18, but if you add up the digits, 1 plus 8 is 9. 3 times 9 is 27, and if you add up the digits, 2 plus 7 is 9. And as you look through all the multiples of 9, you'll notice that as you keep going, you keep adding up the digits of that answer, and you get 9. The only one that we would have an exception is 11 times 9, and maybe larger ones where you see 99, and when you add 9 plus 9, you don't get 9, you actually get 18. However, 1 plus 8 is 9. So this is the technique in general. The 9 pattern here is simply that if you take multiples of 9, the sum of the digits eventually, after you do it more than once if necessary, will always be 9. That's kind of interesting. Let's see if we can find a pattern with 8. What we're going to do is go through and multiply a few numbers by 8 and look for a pattern. I went ahead and wrote out all the problems, and let's solve them and see what we get. 1 times 8 is 8. 2 times 8 is 16. Now remember the pattern that we had in the 9s is we added up the digits. So 1 plus 6 is 7. Hmm. Let's keep going. 3 times 8 is 24. And 2 plus 4 is equal to 6. Let's keep going. 4 times 8 is 32. And 3 plus 2 is 5. Now at this point you might start seeing the pattern. It goes 8, 7, 6, 5. And you might predict you're going to get 4 in the next one. Let's see. 5 times 8 is 40. And 4 plus 0 is 4. Okay, cool. The next one you might expect 3. 6 times 8 is 48, and 4 plus 8 is 12. Uh, that's not 3. Oh, but wait a second. 1 plus 2 is equal to 3. So it does work. And then we can keep going. For 7 times 8, we get 56. Add them up, and you end up with 2 after 2 steps. 8 times 8 is 64. Adding up the digits, you end up with a 1 overall. But now the question is, what are we going to get next? Uh, it's not so clear this time. Are we going to get 0? It keeps dropping, but what are we going to get next? Let's see what we get. 9 times 8 is 72, and 7 plus 2 is 9. That's kind of interesting. Uh, let's do another one and just see what we get. 10 times 8 is 80, and 8 plus 0 is 8. And my speculation is that it's just starting to go down again, and as soon as we got to 1, it looped back to the 9. Let's see. 11 times 8 is 88. 8 plus 8 is 16. And then 1 plus 6 is 7. So yes, the pattern will reestablish itself. When it goes from 1, it jumps to 9, and then continues to go down. Let's write that down. The sum of the digits goes down by 1 each time and loops from 1 to 9. And so this is the 8 pattern. You might try it for other numbers just for interest. Let's look at another interesting pattern. Here's a large problem. 9 times this large number plus 10. Now the thing with problems like this is yes, some calculators can do it, but that's not the point. The point is we want to see a pattern and try to generate a pattern based on how it's set up. So take a look at these three problems. My hope is that you can look at these three problems and see that this problem is a continuation of these first three problems. 9 times 1 plus 2. 9 times 1, 2 plus 3. 9 times 1, 2, 3 plus 4. And up here it's 9 times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 plus 10. And so on. Now this pattern might break down after you get past this point, but let's see if we can go through and figure out what the answer would be 
without just punching the large problem in your calculator. Look for the pattern. And also a warning, order of operations. Multiplication comes first. 9 times 1 is 9. 9 plus 2 is 11. 9 times 12 is 108. 108 plus 3 is 111. 9 times 123 is 1,107 plus 4 is 1,111. So I think the pattern is obvious. You get all 1's when you do this, and the number of 1's is the number that you're adding. That's the pattern, so let's write that down first off. The number of 1's in the answer of all 1's is the number that you added. So now let's take a look at this pattern. If we were to do this for the large problem, we would expect there to be 10 ones in the answer. So that's 1,111,111,111,111. 1, 111, to get our answer. Here's an interesting problem. Let's see if we can find a pattern of adding the numbers from 1 to 199, which has only odd numbers here, you'll notice. And this sum has 100 terms in it. If you think about it, you're basically going from 1 to 200, but you're skipping half the numbers, and thus you have 100 numbers in the pattern. Using what we thought about on the last slide of looking at smaller cases, let's do the same thing here. Well, the first one is just 1. If I just take the first number, I just get 1. If I take the first two numbers, I get 4. If I take the first three numbers, I get 9. If I take the first four numbers, I get 16. And let's do one more. If I take the first five numbers, I get 25. Now, what I want you to do is take a look at this pattern. This pattern is a number sequence that should be familiar to you. And if it's not, you want to get into a habit of spotting this one because it's kind of common. These numbers, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, they are all perfect squares. And so what I want to point out is this is 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, and 5 squared. So let's say I had added up these numbers plus 11, then you would expect to get 6 squared, which is 36. Let's write down the pattern. The sum is the square of the number of terms in the sum. With that said, that now makes this problem kind of easy. If I add up all the numbers from 1 to 199 that are odd, there are 100 numbers there, so I get 100 squared, which is 10,000. Now this problem would be a lot harder to do in a calculator. Plus it would be a bit impractical, you might make a mistake. This is faster to look for patterns. The problems that we just did are what we call inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is basically the idea of look at smaller examples, gather enough information, and take a guess. Now that guess should be relatively accurate, but it's kind of hard to say sometimes. What we now want to look at is a very small introduction to deductive reasoning. You could make a whole course on deductive reasoning, but the idea is you use some sort of general logic system. And in order to go further with that, I would honestly have to give you our general logic system, which is a bit time consuming. But anyway, we can just take some sort of intuitive ideas for this class. You take some information and you formulate a conclusion. Let's try one we're going to assume that the statements below are true. If it is raining, then it is cloudy. I'm assuming that's true, and within reason, it is. If it's raining, there's got to be clouds somewhere dropping the rain. And then we're also going to assume it is raining. So if we know that if it's raining, then it's cloudy, and we know it is raining, we can come to a conclusion from these two statements. Therefore, it is cloudy. Pretty straightforward. This is a concept called modus ponens, sometimes just referred to as direct implication, that if you got this question right without having to hear it from me, you're already pretty used to using this kind of logic. 
The last thing we want to talk about is at times you can have a conclusion that's actually not true. We need to be careful and make sure that we always think about this fully. So these kind of questions, I get a lot of people looking at it and they mess up with some of the facts. They sometimes look at the first sentence and just say, well, that's the one that's got the problem. But remember, when we're talking about logic, we assume the first statement is true. And the therefore is what we're really looking at. If a person gets rained on, then they will be wet. Okay, we're assuming that's true. Therefore, if a person is wet, then they were rained on. All I've really done is switch the order of the statement. Person getting rained on turned into them being wet. Now I'm saying them being wet means they got rained on. I think you can quickly see that is not true. If a person is wet, they could have gotten wet for a multitude of reasons. This is what we sometimes call the converse, and the converse is not always true. Sometimes it is, but not always. The person could have gotten wet a different way, such as taking a shower. Or you can fill in the blank as to whatever you think is a good way for a person to get wet. Next example. If a person puts on shoes, then they must put on socks first. We're assuming that's true. Yes, you could technically wear your shoes without your socks, but for the sake of this problem, we're assuming that if a person puts on shoes, they will always put on socks. Therefore, if you put on socks, you will put on shoes next. This problem is sort of the same idea. You're saying that if a person has this, then they have a prerequisite, if you will. Putting on shoes forces the prerequisite of putting on socks. However, a prerequisite just simply means in order to do this, you must have done this first. That does not mean if you do the first thing, then you're going to do the second thing. It's just saying the second thing requires the first. So with that said, if you put on socks, you will put on shoes next? Not necessarily. You could put on socks to keep your feet warm. This is all I plan to say about deductive reasoning, but keep in mind, the idea is if you switch around a statement, it's not necessarily true. 